Bible, and I hope that you do, I invite you to open it with me to Deuteronomy chapter 5 as we continue our series, House Rules. We've been looking at the Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses, but we are applying them to the family. And as you're turning in your Bible, let me say what a great job Evan did last week leading us in worship as he preached. And Evan, what a great word. Thank you, brother, for that word. Deuteronomy chapter 5, we're going to be looking at the 10th commandment this morning. Now, next week, we will return to the 5th commandment for Mother's Day, honor your father and mother. But today, we're looking at the 10th and final commandment from Deuteronomy 5, verse 21. The Bible says... Do not covet your neighbor's wife or desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male or female slave, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Let me ask you a question this morning. How much is enough? Have you ever thought about that before? How much is enough when it comes to all the areas of your life? How much uh, is enough in terms of how much time you give to your employer on the job? How much is enough in terms of total compensation that you receive? How much is enough in terms of square footage of a home? How much is enough in terms of how much you pay for your car, how much is enough in terms of time and what you spend with your children and your family? How much is enough when it comes even to the things of God? You know, this morning we're going to look at a command that some have called the unenforceable commandment. Say, what do you mean by that? Well, this commandment is hard to put your finger on because it's difficult to notice. Uh, There are those who could be committing covetousness right now and no one would ever know about it. If it were a felony, it would be hard to indict someone on coveting because it could be hidden. You know, it's interesting because the first nine commandments that we've dealt with are outward commands, but this last one is an inward command. The first nine deal with outward actions, but this one is based on an attitude. The first nine are based on deeds, but this is based on desire. And I want to say something very clear as we begin this morning. If there's one area where Satan will tempt you, it's in the area of coveting. You say, how do you know that, Pastor? Well, Satan, his schemes are as old as he is. Satan is crafty, but he's not creative. Let me say that again. Satan is crafty, but he is not creative. And if you understand the patterns of Satan, you'll be able to disarm his power. If you understand his pattern and his schemes and the way that he operates that you'll be able to disarm his power. If you remember there in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3, there were three temptations that Adam and Eve faced. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life. We could describe that as appetite, approval, and ambition. And you could summarize the temptations of Satan in these three phrases. Do I have enough? Am I good enough? Am I doing it enough? Do I have enough appetite? Am I good enough approval? Am I doing enough ambition? And all three of the temptations of Satan are based on coveting. And so this morning, I want to provide you a roadmap for God's Word so that you can disarm the power of Satan when it comes to the trap of covetousness in your own life. In fact, did you know that the word coveting appears 21 times in the Old Testament? But the examples and applications of coveting are filled throughout the Scriptures. And maybe you're wondering this morning, Is it wrong to want to do well in life, to be successful, 
to provide for your family? Is hard work and ambition, are, are those things wrong? No, they're not. But it is wrong when we become discontent in the Lord and we no longer are satisfied in the things of God. If there's anything that God wants from you, it's for you to be satisfied in Him. And so this idea of coveting really carries two key things. This idea of excessive desire and also excessive envy. Envious desire and excessive desire. We don't use the word coveting a lot today, but think of the words greed and materialism and jealousy and envy. And that's the concept that we're going to be dealing with today in the 10th commandment. So let's look one more time at Deuteronomy chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. And notice the command. It's very simple. Do not covet. Now before we go any further about what it means to covet and what the results are in your own life, I want to deal with three myths Uh, Three misnomers, uh, common lies related to the 10th commandment. I think it's important to deal with each of these because you've probably heard these lies before. The first one is this, that your worth is based on your net worth. We live in a consumeristic society today. And so often you are told that there is an app that can make you happy. There's a product that if you consume, that it'll bring happiness in life. We're told in America that we are the brands that we wear and the products that we consume. And so often, people, Christians, find their identity in a brand rather than in the gospel and in Christ alone. I want to tell you this morning that there is nothing humanly speaking, materially speaking, that can satisfy the human soul. You are not made for brands. You are not made for consumption. You are not made for materialism. You were made for God. And nothing can satisfy the human soul unless it's God and God alone. See, there's the thought out there that if if you have a particular educational background, that you'll have fulfillment in life. Or maybe if you have the right 401k, that you'll be happy. If you have the right experiences in life, that that will be the source and the well of your happiness. But our identity as believers comes in Christ and Christ alone. What makes us unique this morning is that we have a room full of people of various educational backgrounds, political backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds, but the one thing that unites us is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Christianity is about breaking down of barriers that the world has put up. You know, the Bible says that there is neither Jew nor Gentile. Gentile, but we are found in Jesus Christ in Christ alone. You know, the world wants to divide us, but the gospel unites. It's only the gospel which you can unite brothers and sisters together. And so I want you to know this morning that your identity is not found in the products you consume. It's not based on the things that you wear, whatever moniker that you have on your shirt today. That's not where your identity is found. Your identity is not based on the neighborhood in which you live. Your identity, your focus is found on Christ and Christ alone, and only He can satisfy. But there's another misnomer about covetousness, and that's that this is something that only the wealthy deal with. You know, it's been said that in our society that there are three types of people. The haves, the have-nots, and the have-not paid for what they have. Maybe you can associate today. But we're told that the average American adult has two to $3,000 worth of credit card debt, but when you multiply the number of credit cards, we're told that it's between seven dollars to $10,000. And the people think, well, only the... Wealthy, only those who are materially prosperous, they deal with envy and jealousy and covetousness. That's not true. See, how much is enough? Someone once said, just a little bit more. Maybe you're poor this morning, so you think, nah, it doesn't deal with me. No, this is a sin that Satan can use to trap you. This is not based on how much money that you bring home. Anyone can deal with the area of covetousness. 
And also someone might think, well, are desires bad? Desires are not a bad thing in and of themselves. That's Buddhism. It says that when you reach to the state of nirvana, that then all the, the desire has been taken away. No, desires are not bad in and of themselves. Hear me this morning, though. An imbalance of desire is what is wrong. The Bible says that we should desire spiritual gifts. Do you know that each person in here this morning, that you have a spiritual gift that has been endowed by God? You need to use that spiritual gift, not just for your benefit, but the benefit of someone else. We, we don't have the same spiritual gifts, and therefore we need one another. If you are a believer in Jesus, you have a spiritual gift, and the Bible says that you should desire to know that spiritual gift. Now, the Bible also says that it's good to desire peace and tranquility. We want to live in a society that's at peace so the gospel can go forward. We want to be with peace with all brothers and sisters. You know, it's also, it's good to desire a godly spouse. That's what the Bible says. The Bible also says that it's a good thing to desire to serve the Lord. 1 Timothy 3. It's a good desire to want to serve in the office of pastor. There are some good desires in life. But when those desires become excessive... And when we become envious of others, what that ultimately says is we are not grateful for what God has already given to us. So with those myths out there and dispe dispelling those myths, I want to deal with the three results when you covet. Now there are three byproducts, three results when you covet. The first is it turns your heart into a thief. Did you know that the Tenth Command is the internalization of the Eighth Commandment? You've probably never thought about it like that. Do you know that lust is adultery of the heart? That's what Jesus says in Matthew 5. Hatred is murder of the heart, Matthew 5. Covetousness is theft of the heart. Therefore, covetousness is the internalization of the Eighth Commandment. You remember me preaching from Matthew 15, 19 not long ago where Jesus said, that which proceeds from the heart, that being evil thoughts, sexual immorality, in that list it says envy, jealousy, and covetousness. Did you know that when you covet, it shows that there's corruption of the heart? As we've said before, that the problem of the heart is at the heart of the problem. See, all of our hearts are far from God, and when we covet, when we desire that which the Lord hasn't given to us, that reveals that there's a heart problem. And not only that, it will rob you of the joy of your contentment. Do you know that God wants you to be content in life? For you to be satisfied in Him? There's nothing wrong with doing well in life. I know many of you, and God has blessed you with great jobs, and that you are doing well for your family, that you're blessing others. But when you covet, essentially what you are doing is that you are robbing yourself of the joy of being satisfied in God. Did you know that it is impossible for you to be satisfied in God and covet at the same time? Whenever, whenever someone is coveting, that means that their contentment in God has waned. It is impossible. Let me say that again. It is impossible for you to be satisfied and fulfilled in God and covet at the same time. And what God wants for each of us is to experience in the joy of being content in Him that only Christ and Christ alone can satisfy your soul. You are not created for anything else. You are not created for this world. You are not created for materialism. You are not created for things. You are not created for houses and more unique experiences. You were created for the Lord. So many people live in the land of Ur. Can you say that? The land of Ur. Costlier, bigger, better. So many people live in that land rather than living in the land of satisfaction and contentment in the Lord. See, there's one other result, and that's this. It makes good things into idols. 
I've shared with you before that a good thing that takes a godlike status can ultimately become a bad thing. Isn't it interesting that the tenth commandment bookends with the first commandment? The first commandment have no other idols, have no other gods. And the last one is do not covet. You see, when you covet, ultimately it's a belief problem. What you're saying is, God, I'm not satisfied in what you have given me. If God hasn't done anything else or does not do anything else for us, the fact that he saved us is enough. All right, let me, let me come over here and let me say that again. If God does not do anything else for you, the fact that he saved you is enough. Amen? That he reached us out of the pit of hell, of the things of our past, of our sin and our shame, and he lifted us up and he gave us a new life, new hope, new purpose, and a new identity. If that's all that God ever did for us, that would be enough. And so that when we covet, what we're ultimately saying is, God, you're not enough. God, you haven't given me enough. God, you're, you haven't been good to me. God, I deserve more. When God's saying that, do you look at all the blessings that I've given unto you? A blessing is anything that God uses to bring us closer to Him. A blessing could be material prosperity. But did you know that a blessing could also be cancer and suffering? Anything that the Lord uses to bring us closer to Him can be seen as a blessing in life. And when we are not satisfied ultimately in God, what we say is, God, you haven't done enough for me. So I believe that in here today that there are many folks that deal with this particular issue of coveting. Maybe that you say, God, you wouldn't say it like this, but God, I question if you've been and good to me. Let me share a quick story with you. Um, on Fridays when I pick up my son Conrad from uh, school, we like to go to McDonald's and get a Happy Meal. Uh, now, I don't know about you, but the hot French fries from McDonald's cannot be beat. I don't care what you say about Chick-fil-A fries or Arby's fries. McDonald's fries are the best out there. And so Conrad, he loves getting the Happy Meal. You know, McDonald's, they have done a masterful job of marketing to families. And, you know, families go through the drive through get the Happy Meal. And so as we were going by one day, Conrad said, I want double fries uh, with chicken nuggets and then the toy. And so because Conrad got double fries, I thought, well, you know, he can pay a dad tax. You know, I get a few on the, uh, before I hand them back to him. And so I, I ate a few of the fries and Conrad, he said, hey, those are mine. And I thought to myself, does he not realize the source who gave him these fries? Does he not have that I have the authority to take them away? And that I also, I can drive back through the drive-thru and I can get me a supersized fry if I want to. Many of you dads have been there before. And in that moment, I thought, you know, how often that's how we approach God. Say, God, wh why'd you take this away from me? God, that's mine. When God's saying, I'm the one that gave it to you in the first place. That it's mine and I can take it away at any time, and I have enough in equity to pay for it myself. God owns it all. He's the source of the blessing, and He can take it away at any time. If God has given you anything that's good, it's a blessing from Him. And so I think that as believers that we need to understand the signpost, the warning signs when we may be close to coveting. I want to give you five of those this morning. The first is this. Uh, you can tell that you're close to covetousness when there's an established pattern of hurting others. Maybe you've never thought about it that way. You've heard before that Hurting people hurt people. You say, yeah, pastor, I get that. But I want you to think about it like this today. You can either love people or love things, but it's unlikely that you will love both well. Let me say that again. You will either love people or you will love things, 
but it's unlikely that you will love both well. And if you are loving things, it's unlikely that you are loving people. But when you love someone, it's impossible to covet the things that they own because you love them. That you see it as a blessing. You're thankful there's a heart of gratitude that God has given those things to them. So if if you're constantly in a state of hurting other people, it could be because the sin of covetousness, of excessive desire and excessive envy is boiling beneath the surface. And really you're upset because you think that you deserve more than what God has allotted to you. So often that we want to elevate people because of their gifts rather than to elevate them because of who they are and because of their soul. I've recently been been watching what's taking place at Hillsong Church and the implosion that you're seeing around the world in some of these churches. And one common denominator that I see is that there are people who are elevated because of their gifts rather than them being elevated because of their character and their integrity. When we get to the place where our charisma and our giftings outpace our character and our integrity, it is at that point that we will see an implosion in the Lord. See, the problem is when we elevate people because of their gifts. You should love someone just because of who they are, not because of what they can do for you or what they bring to the table, but simply because that they are someone that is made in the image of God and that you love them for who they are. So either you can love people or you can love things, but it's unlikely that you will love both well. So someone that is constantly hurting others, it's likely that they're dealing with Jealousy and envy, they love things more than people. Here's another sign of covetousness. When we're preoccupied with increasing our wealth. Now let me stop right there. There is nothing wrong with being materially prosperous. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. It doesn't say that money itself is the root of evil. The love of money... The problem is not you owning possessions. The problem is when possessions own you. When possessions become a God in your life. There are many of you that God has blessed with a great job and you've made a lot of money. And the book of Proverbs commends hard work and saving and taking care of your assets. But the question this morning is, Are you willing to give those things to God? Or maybe you're at a season in your life that you're no longer trying to build, you're just trying to protect. You're trying to secure. But is God the Lord over your finances? We often say Jesus is either Lord of all, but not Lord at all. And we'll say, yeah, He can be Lord over the spiritual matters, but not over the financial matters. But that is a false dichotomy. Part of the spiritual matters is the financial matters because God owns it all. God doesn't need your money or your resources. He owns it all in the first place. But God allows us to invest in His kingdom so we divest of ourselves the things that we want so that we can advance the kingdom of God. I want you to think about it like this this morning. Every time that you are giving unto the Lord, you release the grip of covetousness in your life. When you give unto the Lord, when you are faithful to tithe, when you are faithful to give, you are releasing the grip of covetousness on your own heart so that Satan can no longer trick you and scheme you with his devices, but rather that you are giving yourself to the Lord. So this morning, are you preoccupied with increasing your wealth, or are you using your wealth to advance the things of the Lord? Here's another sign to avoid covetousness. When you lack generosity. The Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. Being full of gratitude. I've noticed that there are those that they'll never give unto the church. Uh, but then they'll spend thousands of dollars for a Super Bowl ticket or they'll spend uh, millions of dollars on a home. Can, Can I remind you this morning, you are not giving to the church. You are giving to God 
through the church. That's an important distinction. You're not just giving unto the church. You are giving to God, but God's expression for the gospel to go forward and His work to advance in this life is God loves the church. He died for the church. God believes in the local church. And so when you are giving unto God first, but you do it through the church, when you fail to give, that shows that there is not a generous heart. You know, it does my heart well to see the faithfulness of Friendly Avenue because you have been faithful in your giving. And it's not that you're being faithful unto me or even that you're being faithful unto this church. When you give unto the Lord, that shows that you are being faithful unto God. See, there's another issue on how we can avoid covetousness in a signpost, and that's you can know that covetousness is around when there's a complaining and grumbling spirit. You know, often those who are constantly complaining and grumbling and griping, it's because they don't think that God has been fair to them. What about you this morning? You think God has been fair to you? You think God has been good to you? You know, what what happened in a church, what could happen in the life of a Christian, if no longer that we walked around complaining and grumbling and questioning, God, have you been good to me? But rather, with the assets that he's given us, we say, God, how can we use these to multiply what you are doing here on earth? Which brings me to the last point, and that's we can see a signpost to avoid covetousness when there's discontentment. You know, this week as I was studying this this message, which I don't know that there has ever been a church member to come up to me and say, yeah, I struggle with coveting. That's something that just doesn't happen. It's, It's one of those sins that we know that it's there, but we don't want to admit. It's unlikely that unless you're in a religious setting this week, somebody will even use the word covetousness or coveting. But it's something that all of us deal with. And so as I was praying in my own heart this week, because this is something that I deal with and you deal with as well, there was a prayer that the Lord brought to mind that I want to share with you as we close. I said, Lord, help me to be faithful over that which you have given to me. Lord, help me to be hardworking in that which you will give to me. But Lord, let me be satisfied in whatever you do and choose to give me. Let me say that again. Because I think that if that was the prayer that all of us had each day, day, it would change the way that we live. God, help me to be faithful over that which you have given to me. All of us are stewards. You say, I don't have a lot of money. Well, you have other things. Time, resources, energy. God has given you an allotment to be used for His purposes. God, help me to be faithful over that which You have given to me. And Lord, whatever You choose to give me one day, Lord, I will be hardworking. Hard work is a good thing. Lord, I will have ambition, not ungodly ambition, not the type of ambition that tries to jump over people and climbs the ladder at the expense of others, but I'm just going to be hardworking, God, in whatever You choose to give me. But at the end of the day, Lord, that which you do give me, I'm going to be satisfied because you're enough. Faithful in what God has given you, hardworking in what God will give give to you, but whatever he does, that you say, oh God, that's enough. And you're enough because my soul is satisfied in you. With every head bowed and with every eye closed, as we move into a time of response, you know, one of the things that we've been doing during this sermon series is having a time of prayer together with our families. And we are going to have a time in the service where we can respond to salvation and to being baptized. Maybe you need to be a church member and God's impressing that upon your heart, but that's going to wait for just a moment. Because I believe that God wants us to to pray together and for our families to be strengthened. 
And the same prayer that I just offer to you is what I'm going to ask for families to pray together this morning as we come forward, as we've done through this entire series. God, help me to be faithful over that which you have already given me. God, may I be hardworking in the things that you will give me. But may I be satisfied in whatever you choose to give me. Where you're at right now, I'm going to ask everybody if you would go ahead and stand. And families, if you would slip out, and I want you to pray that prayer together as a family, that you would be found faithful, that you would be found hardworking, but you would find satisfaction and contentment in the Lord. It was Augustine who says that our soul will not find rest until we find rest in thee. So at this time, Aaron's beginning to play. Families are stepping out. Families, would you come now as we pray together? We've been doing this through our entire series. Maybe your family's not here, but grab someone else uh, that's beside you and come and pray together. Would you pray that you would be faithful over the things that God has given to you, that you'd be hardworking in what that which God will give to you, but you would be satisfied and content in whatever God may give to you. As families are stepping out, people are still coming, we invite you to come. Here in just a moment, we're going to have a hymn of invitation, but we want you to pray together that you would find the joy of contentment, satisfaction in the Lord. Families, would you come? Would you step out now?